Start basketball. An individual behavior thing that we do to build culture is something that we that we call start, stop, keep. And those again are just behaviors. There are behaviors that we all do, and we can just obviously talk about basketball, but within the basketball world, there are behaviors that we need to start doing, we need to stop doing, and we need to keep doing to allow our teams to be successful. Aaron Fern is in his third season as a men's basketball assistant coach at UNC Charlotte. Fern is also the head coach of New Zealand's U19 national team. Fern joined the 49ers coaching staff after nine years as head coach of the National Basketball League's Cairns Taipans, which plays in Australia's top professional league. In his nine seasons at the helm of the Taipans, he coached 264 games and guided them to three appearances in the NBL playoffs. In 2011, he led the team to an appearance in the NBL Finals. In 2015, he coached the Taipans to a record 21 wins and another appearance in the league finals while garnering NBL Coach of the Year honors. Prior to becoming the head coach, Fern spent seven seasons as an assistant coach for the Taipans. Fern, who is from Cairns, Queensland, Australia, played college basketball in the United States. He played the 93-94 season at Western Wisconsin Technical College. Then he played the 94-95 season at Mid-State Technical College where he earned an associate's degree. He played his final two seasons at Mayville State University in Mayville, North Dakota. Following his time as a college player, Fern also enjoyed a successful playing career back in Australia. Hey, Hoopheads, I wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Sign up now for their virtual camp 2.0 featuring 10 days of workouts with pro trainers from the Dr. Dish family. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Anthony Camara from the University of Alabama in Huntsville, and you're listening to the Hoopheads podcast. Prepare like the pros with the all new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Fast Draw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years you'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering Hoopheads listeners 15% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code HHP15 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. If you're looking to improve your coaching, please consider joining the Hoopheads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly, mike at hoopheadspod.com. Follow us on social media at hoopheadspod on Twitter and Instagram, and be sure to check out the Hoopheads Podcast Network for more great basketball content. Are you tired of overpaying for your video and analytics platform? Well, it's time to check out QuickCut.com, a platform built by coaches for coaches. QuickCut is undeniably more affordable. It's all cloud-based and comes packed with features to help high schools and youth programs store, share, and analyze game film. Make the switch, get double the storage, and save your program up to 50% on the fastest growing video editing system in the country. For more information or to request a free trial, visit QuickCut.com basketball. 
That's Q-W-I-K-C-U-T dot com. Have a notebook candy as you listen to this episode of Aaron Fern, men's basketball assistant coach at UNC Charlotte. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads podcast. It's Mike Lindsing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the podcast Aaron Fern, assistant men's basketball coach at UNC Charlotte. Aaron, welcome to the Hoop Heads pod. Hey, thanks guys. I really appreciate being on and uh, look, looking forward to chatting. Glad to have you on, get a chance to dive into the things that you've been able to do in the game of basketball throughout your career. I want to go back in time to when you were a kid. Talk to us a little bit about your first experiences with the game of basketball. Yeah, well, look, I, um, you know, I was born in Australia and, uh, and grew up in New Zealand and uh, got introduced to the game by two American coaches, actually. Um, Coach Steve McKean, who uh, played at uh, Santa Barbara back in the day, uh, coach, played in New Zealand, profession, uh, coached professionally in New Zealand, um, and he was... Uh, coaching the pro team in my hometown in in New Plymouth in New Zealand. And uh, my high school coach was a former Washington State Cougar by the name of Angelo Hill. And they they gave me an opportunity to play the game and I fell in love with it. And um, the passion that they coached with, and Angelo at the time was still playing, um, and the, the passion he played with, uh, I get, I guess, just you know, push some buttons with me, and and uh, I fell in love with the game, and um, and that's how it kind of went from there. And um, you know, I left, <clears throat> I left New Zealand at 17 years old to come to the U.S. and did a year of high school in Winona, Minnesota, and played a couple of years of junior college basketball, and then played. Uh, for Mayville State University and NAI school in Mayville, North Dakota. And my coach at that point was uh, Coach Tim Miles, who, uh, you know, coached at Nebraska a couple of seasons ago and now, now is at San Jose State. And, um, and then uh, things just kept rolling from there. But, um, yeah, I guess just getting back to that question, you know, like just growing up in New Zealand, not obviously a huge basketball country, um, but growing as as the game is around the world. And, um, you know, that's how I got into the game. What was the youth basketball scene like in New Zealand when you were growing up? In other words, where were you playing? How were you getting out and practicing? Who were you playing against? What Just what was the system like when you were growing up at that time? I mean, New Zealand's obviously a huge rugby union country. That's what every every young boy dreams to be a you know a, a national a national team player for the New Zealand rugby union team. But um, your yeah, basketball at the time it's bigger in high school than it is in Australia. Australia is more of a club based system um where new zealand's a little bit more focused on the high school system so angelo hill as i mentioned earlier coached the high school team uh you know we'd go away to you know national championships that's what you really built for um to get to that point to go play at a national championship um you would play some regional tournaments around the country you know it's pretty easy to get around new zealand it's not very big um but yeah, back then, uh, you know, it's obviously grown tremendously since I was playing in high school back in what have been really early '90s um, to where it is today. But it's still it still is very high school based um, in New Zealand. The club system's grown a little bit more in New Zealand, but um, yeah, that's how it's kind of run in that part of the world. We're in Australia, <clears throat> you know, more club based. Um, and you build to play in state, you know, you build your season to play in state championships and, um, and then hopefully you get selected for a state team that goes away to national championships. And, um, you know, I obviously lived in Australia for 20 years after leaving the U S here after university was done and, and, uh, you know, got into coaching and playing there. But, um, yeah, obviously two countries pretty close together. 
um, but kind of run their junior programs a little different. How did you end up in the U.S., and specifically, how did you end up in Minnesota? Yeah, that goes back to Coach Steve McKean. Um, he was from Minnesota. Um, I still remember it to this day. I was actually at the YMCA in, in New Plymouth working out, and um, the uh, receptionist lady walked into the gym and said, hey, Aaron, you got a call? Got a call? And I'm like, okay, I go answer the phone. It's Coach McKean. <laughs> Coach McKean and he'd been he'd gone back to the US on holiday and um, said, Hey, would you be interested in coming to high school in the US? I'm like, for sure I would. And he goes, Well, I'll be back back in New Zealand in a couple of weeks. I'll sit down with your family and man, one thing led to a net to another and all of a sudden I was hopping on a plane by myself flying flying to the other side of the world and um, lived with a number of different host families and um, had someone that really looked after me that I still keep in very close contact with now, Jerry Raditz, who still lives in Winona, Minnesota. And um, he was big into the basketball and the baseball. He's, you know, he was a scout for the Cincinnati Reds at the time. He's a scout with the uh, Dodgers now. But also during the winter months was a scout in the CBA, which is, you know, basically the G League now. And uh, yeah, he just kind of, taught me the ropes on high school hoops and college hoops and and you know the pro hoops at the time and would take me to Minnesota Timberwolves games and um, you know it was obviously a huge a huge help for me just trying to get me to understand the the basketball world here which is obviously number one in the world coming from the little old city where I come from in New Zealand so that was a uh, you know, that was a huge, steep learning curve for me, but, you know, played on an outstanding high school team and um, won a conference championship. And I think we lost in the regional final or something to go to the state championship or something like that back then. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, remember those days, made a lot of really close friends and, and stay in contact with a lot of those people um, from way back then. And, um yeah, the, the the game can take you to some amazing places. It definitely can. There's no question about that. What? How did your mom feel? How did your parents feel? How did your family feel about you packing up and heading over to the United States? And what were those conversations like leading up to the decision to go? I mean, obviously, super difficult for the, you know, for my parents. Um, you know, mom never live, never wants to see her her son leave, but. <clears throat> She, she totally understood that it was something I really, really wanted to do and was really supportive. I've got two younger brothers. Um, you know, they now live in Australia. They now live in Perth, and they've been hugely supportive of my basketball journey and, and knew it was something I, that I loved and I wanted to do and um, came to the U.S. and watched me play in high school, watched me play in college obviously supported me during my coaching time, coaching days in Australia. And, um, yeah, not easy, you know, and wasn't easy for me either. You know, I'm hopping on a plane by myself at 17 years old, flying the other side of the world. I've never been to the U S before, and, um, making a journey to Minneapolis and then driving to Winona, Minnesota, which obviously was a I had to grow up pretty quickly and become pretty independent pretty quickly. But as I said earlier, I had some amazing families I stayed with and um, yeah, it was a phenomenal experience which changed the course of my life. You know, it, it opened up doors and, and opportunities that I'll be forever grateful for. And um, you know, and I've always I've always wanted to give back to the game and, and share the game and teach the game and, and help young help young athletes realize their dreams and um, you know I think that's really important. When did coaching get on your radar? When did you start to think about coaching as a profession? Was it something that was always in the back of your mind throughout your playing career or was it something that when your playing career ended, you're getting ready to graduate, and now you look around, and you say, "Hey, I still want to be involved in that in the game." Which one of those scenarios better describes how you came to coaching? Yeah, that's a good question. I, 
I, I felt like I always wanted to coach, even when I was even when I was in high school in New Zealand, when I was playing for Angelo Hill, like I coached, you know, junior teams in high school. And it's just something I really enjoyed doing. Um, I could feel it then. And I think during, during my high school career here in the US and college career, um, you know, my semi-professional career in Australia that led to my professional playing career that led into a coaching career um i guess it was just in the blood and i and i i think you coach players over your i i definitely coach players over my time that you just know that hey they could be a good coach one day they understand the game they have a good feel for the game they read the game they communicate the game to their teammates that don't quite get it like that um, I, I guess I was just one of those type of people. I felt like I could help people play the game even when I played because I, I feel like I could see it at a, at a level that I guess coaches do. Um, so, yeah, but, yeah, to, to answer that question, I think it was kind of in the, in the veins pretty early on. Talk a little bit about your professional career in Australia, what that was like, what your experiences were, and just give us maybe a highlight or something that you're always going to remember that you're going to take with you for the rest of your life from that professional career. Yeah, so um, so I was playing in, you know, I was, I was, finishing, I was finishing up my senior year at Mayville State, and um, we had a, I guess I had a relationship with a, uh, a guy, Nels Pop, who his dad, Rob Pop, coached uh, in Wisconsin and now and was coaching in Australia at the time. And we did like a little tryout in, Win in, in Winona. And he was at the time coaching a Division II program, like a semi-professional program in Australia. And I never, I don't know why I felt this way. I just I, I wanted to go to Australia to try and play at that level than go back to New Zealand and play. Um, and so that's the journey that I went and, um, and, you know, in college and small NAI division two basketball, I was playing like a power forward four man position. I got to Australia and started playing with, you know, men and went, eh, I'm probably a little small to play that <laughs> position, you know? And so I had to really, um, improve my perimeter skills and my perimeter shooting. And I worked really hard at that. Um, that first year that I played on that team, we actually won, um, the national championship, uh, the Australian national championship at the time for, uh, semi-professional division two basketball in Australia, which was obviously a, a huge, a huge highlight, you know, cause Cairns, Australia is on the very far northeast coast of Australia in the tropics. It's in a city of 150,000 people. And, you know, the, the kind of the mecca of basketball in Australia is Melbourne, Australia. And so, you know, the, the talent and the competitiveness and just the sheer numbers of who plays is really high at that end of the country, at, you know, the bottom of the country. And, you know, we're taking on the rest of the country and won a championship. You know, Coach Pop was, um, how would I describe him? maybe a little Bobby Knightish, the way he coached, <laughs> you know, it was very demanding, required amazing discipline. You know, we played motion, but I just think getting back to what I said earlier, just having that feel for the game. And I, I totally understood where he came from. Felt like I had the understanding of what he wanted and how the game should be played, you know, player movement, ball movement. You know, we played a motion offense. So I felt like I understood that well. And, you know, we had American imports on our team and, um, as you know, as, a, as imports are all around the world these days, it was no different for our team. And um, so we did that for a year. And then at the end of that year, um, the Cairns Taipans got, in, got accepted into the NBL, which is obviously the top level in Australia. And um, I was fortunate enough to make that team. Uh, in the first year in 2000 and uh, no 1999 2000 was the first year um, 
after that first season in the NBL, which we really struggled, um, Coach Pop got let go and a new coach came in. And I played for Guy Malloy, who's a, a, a huge mentor of mine um, these days. And uh, we talk on a very regular basis. And I played for him for a year. And then this is when the big decision came. So it was the end of the, fir- end of the first year playing for, for Coach Malloy. And uh, we were in Canberra, Australia on a road trip playing a game. And uh, he wanted to have a conversation with me. And he said, look, you can play for me next year, but I'm going to employ someone to be an assistant coach and fill, and fill another role. And I would like you to consider it. And um, he goes, well, you can play for maybe another one or two years at this level, but I think you've got a longer career being a coach. So the decision's yours. And um you know, in coaching, obviously I've been coaching now since 2001 at the professional level and, um, and made that decision and, and got, got the opportunity to be an assistant coach for the Cairns Taipans and, and learning at that high level because the Australian NBL is a high level league around the world. And, uh, coach Malloy gave me that opportunity and, and, uh, the rest is history when it comes to coaching, really, for that. That's where it all kind of started for me at that level. What are some things that when you think back to your first year or two as an assistant there with the Taipans that you still fall back on or that you still look at those lessons that you learned in that first year or two that have stuck with you throughout your career? Is there anything that you can think of that? Yeah, for sure. Um well, Coach Pop that first year, you know, we played motion, um, ball movement, player movement, patience, um, unbelievable spacing. Um, you know, he was a bit old school. Like when we practiced, we did not go up and down. We played half court. We did half court drills, half court, five on five all the time we really ever went up and down when we went up and down it was on game night so that was very different um and then then coaching and playing with coach malloy uh his discipline and just his preparation and organization was was phenomenal um and those things have kind of stuck with me through my career i I would say that coaches and players that have that have been on my staff or that I've coached would say that I'm, you know, prepared and organized, um, you know, try and cover the what ifs uh, as best as possible. And I probably, you know, I definitely learned those, learned those um, from Coach Malloy and Coach Pop. Um, Because I think you have to be, you know, it's just the old saying, you know, you've got to be prepared and you've got to be prepared really well. Um, for whatever could be coming your way, and and uh, I never want I never wanted my players to be surprised by something. Um, I wanted them to just be prepared. If hey, if this does come, they're like, oh yeah, we've talked about it, we've worked on it. All right, so let's put it into action. Now, are we going to be great at it? Maybe not, but at least it's not a shock. So um, yeah, just the. The professionalism when it came to preparation was uh, definitely a huge thing I learned. So when you think about that professionalism and that making sure that your teams are prepared for what may come at you, how have you applied that in your own career as a coach in terms of taking notes, being aware of what you're doing, making observations, learning from the people that you've been fortunate enough to work for? How have you kind of organized your coaching life in terms of do you have three ring binders? Are you now a computer guy? Do you store files? Just what's your system for keeping track of things that you want to add to your coaching repertoire, if that question makes sense? Yeah, I'm a big uh, building video database guy. Um you know, and sports code is kind of what I've used over my career, and we use it here at Charlotte also. But um, 
you know, just building video playbooks of your drills and your, you know, your defensive system, um, you know, your offensive system, uh, you know, your special situation stuff, all have that video archive that I have databases for days. Um, <laughs> you know, not so much just written written stuff. It's more video um, video stuff for me, so I can just easily go back to it and go, all right, yeah, I want to have a look at And I've tried, obviously, lots of different things. I would probably say that I'm a little bit of a risk taker when I experiment, and I've experimented with a lot of different things over my career, stuff that I like, I don't like, but I've tried it. Some team, Sometimes it works for this team, it does it for others, so you try something different. Um, you know, you're... Uh, you know, I've run the Auburn Shuffle. I've run the Flow Offense. Um, you know, we run Motion here. We run the Princeton stuff here. Um, you know, I've, I've played, when I played for Coach Molloy, we ran the, the Triangle back then in the days. Um, so just having databases of that stuff. Um, I have all that archived for my references to go back back to when I, you know, when I need to. Um, yeah, I guess that's how I, I store and store my information. So as you were building that database and thinking about what you wanted to be when you became a head coach, obviously you're an assistant there with the Taipans for a number of years, seven years or so, and then you get an opportunity to take over as the head coach What's that transition like for you to go from being an assistant to a head coach? What were some of the biggest adjustments that you remember? And then how did you come up with your philosophy, your style of play, what you wanted to be as a head coach by going back and looking through all the things that you had accumulated to that point? So just the transition and then how did you kind of figure out what kind of coach you wanted to be as a head coach versus an assistant? Yeah, good question. I mean, my first year being the Taipans head coach, I had players on my team that were older than me and um, and a lot more experienced than I was. I mean, Phil Jones was one of them. He's a New Zealand you know, national player that had been to Olympics, World Cups, you know, was like recognized on the world stage as being an elite shooter and, you know, the experience he had. And he was phenomenal for me to, to be able to coach him and he let me coach him. Um, and I, that first year, and, and the transition from me being an assistant was, I was an assistant, um, and Nathan Jarwai played for, for the Taipans at the time when I was an assistant. He got drafted by the Toronto Raptors, um, and he asked me to uh, mentor, support him that first year he played in the NBA. So I had kind of a year away from the Taipans while... I was over in Toronto um, and then got the opportunity to be uh, the head coach of the Taipans that following year. And this is where the this is where overseas coaching development is a lot better in my opinion than it is here in the US. So when I was playing semi-professional basketball in Australia, I was coaching the under 18 Cairns team. And then I moved up to the under-23 Cairns team. And then, you know, I transitioned from playing um, playing for that semi-professional team and then became the head coach of that team. So I had, you know, a number of years. I mean, I, that, what's that, seven, eight years of coaching under-18s, under-23s, semi-professional men experimenting, failing, succeeding, you know, trying this, trying that, um, learning to, uh, you know, really build my defensive systems and offensive systems and learning to build culture, and I'm big on that, um, the way that team culture is built in Australia New Zealand is a lot different than here. Um you know, learning to build relationships with players, 
Um, and, you know, a lot of the stuff I didn't do well and got better at over the years of being able to, you know, succeed and fail with those different things. Um, so I took a lot of those experiences into that first year and, you know, the offenses that we ran and defenses that we run and we've been successful at those levels. So I just took that with me up to the NBL and, you know, the Cairns Taipans are not recognized as a powerhouse when it comes to budget and compared to another, another, uh, a number of the other teams in the league. And um, you've got to find other ways to be competitive because you're in the league. It's no different than the NBA with, you know, some of these teams that have huge budgets compared to other markets. We've got to find a way to compete, you know, and your talent's not always going to be as good as, as other teams. So you've got to find a way to build great culture and be really good defensively and play a certain way offensively and, and that's how I built my teams just through the experience of being able to do that. Where here in the US, a lot of coaches don't get, they just don't get those opportunities. Like you play and you become an assistant and you know, you're coaching for somebody that's the head coach and then you might get an opportunity to be a head coach and you've never head coached a game, game ever in your life, ever. And I would have, and I would have done, by that point I got to be, you know, by the time I was a head coach of the Taipans in game one, I probably would have coached, I don't know, 300 games maybe, something like that. You know, like, you know, you learn a lot in 300 games at whatever level. Absolutely. And, you know, dealing with Absolutely. parents and agents and so on and so forth. So, um extremely fortunate and extremely grateful that I had those opportunities and um, you know it prepared me pretty well um, for that first year with the Taipans and then you know year two we went to the NBL finals so um, yeah I think a lot of those experiences really helped. I want to touch on a couple things that you mentioned there while you were talking one is just the difference between how coaches outside of the U.S. are developed and then the system that we have for, well, I guess there may be not, <laughs> maybe we say there isn't a system and I'll just give you a personal example. And then I want to touch back on the culture piece of it and we can uh, talk about that as it relates to what you've done with the Taipans. But first to just kind of give you a personal story about learning and, and getting reps as a coach. So when I graduated from college, I had played for one high school coach, one college coach. That was basically all I knew in terms of basketball X's and O's in terms of drills, in terms of what I was going to do. I basically just mimicked what I learned from those guys. And so I was a JV, high school JV coach for two years. And I ran those teams and tried to do the best I could. I probably wasn't very good as I look back and some of the things that I did that I certainly would do differently. And then I got an assistant coaching job and I was an assistant for, who I guess, 13 or 14 years. But for the first probably 10 of those years, I was only the varsity assistant coach. So to your point, I never coached a game. I was never in charge of calling timeout. I was never in charge of substitutions. I was never in charge of really anything. I mean, I was the suggestion giver. I was not making any decisions. And then after about my 10th year there, I went and I coached one season of JV basketball and I had to go back and call timeout and I had to make substitutions and I was rusty. I was very, I was not very good at it because to your point, I had not had any of those reps. And I do think that here in the U S as you said, the typical role for a coach, especially I think at the college level, you have somebody who is either a former player or I think now you have the route of, there's a lot of guys that go into the student manager route and then they go from the student manager to they go and join a coaching staff and then they're an assistant and they work their way up and eventually they're a head coach. And like you said, they've now never coached a real game. And we've talked to so many coaches, Aaron, on the podcast that have told us that when they were younger, one of the best things that they did was just try to get reps coaching, whether that was coaching AAU basketball or that was just coaching a rec team, just to get those opportunities to coach. So I wanted to ask you, when you think about what you would do to make our U.S. system better 
and obviously you can't wave, wave a magic wand and just totally revamp the system. What are some small changes that you think we could make that would better develop coaches here in the United States? Yeah, man, that's a good question. Um, yeah, because I, I, just to follow on what you're saying quickly, like, you know, under 18s, I, I went away to a Queensland multiple times, Queensland State Championship, coaching in front of, you know, good-sized crowds. And like you said, put in situations where I've got to make in-game quick decisions, substitutions, timeouts, you know, strategy changes, um, and done that for under-23s. And then obviously done that at the semi-professional level where you're now going up another level, like, you know, it's like the comparison of the G League, you know, like coaching in front of bigger crowds. And it's, you know, you've got to satisfy sponsors and your fans and, you know, deal with egos, you know, with men and, you know, like so many things you learn. Um, a lot of coaches here just never get the opportunity to do that. Now, what Australia does an unbelievable job is, co is coach development. Like we have coaching development offices in each state in Australia that goes around and upskills high school coaches, club coaches, um identifies the, the the high level talent on the boys and girls side um puts programs in places that helps develop those athletes because big picture for us is you know those elite that elite talent has got to represent the country one day um i'm not aware that here in the u.s that in each state of this country i feel there should be development development offices, if you want to call them that, that, you know, like the state of North Carolina, there are two or three people in the state that go around helping high school coaches develop their craft by whatever, offenses, defensives, drills, skill development stuff. Um, give them suggestions, ideas. Have you thought about this? That's what we do in Australia. Um, and it helps because the big thing for us is that our big philosophy in Australia is, well, if we, if we produce better coaches, we're going to produce better players. And to coach under 18s or 23s or a state junior team uh, in Australia, you have to get certified through Basketball Australia, which a lot of countries in the world do this, is you just can't go, hey, I want to go coach a you know, North Carolina state team for, you know, men's, if I have, if I'm not being certif certified by USA basketball, that's how it works in Australia. So you have to educate yourself on the game. I feel there are a number of coaches here in this country that are not at that level. Um, I think that would go a long way and you know, that's got to come from the governing body, I guess, um, which would be obviously a huge mission. But other countries in the world, around the world do that. I mean, there's so much talent in this country. I mean, the athleticism, the length, the skills of some of the players is just phenomenal. The feel, like it's exceptional. I mean, if some of those programs were in place, coach development helps in player development, um, the talent would be twofold, threefold. So, um, yeah, I feel like that's some stuff there that I think would really help help develop the junior the junior side of the game in this country. Uh, would be putting those things in place. I love that idea, and I think USA Basketball is taking baby steps towards that it's just interesting that in this country we have because there's such a monetary incentive for people with basketball here in the united states and you think about the different youth basketball leagues and travel and aau and all these different programs and you have adults that are making a living and earning money from youth basketball and a lot of times their incentives don't always align with what the incentives of the ideal situation might be for players and coaches. And I just think 
to your point that if we could figure out a way to better train our coaches at the youngest ages, even if you just think about just a recreation basketball program where you might just have parent volunteers, even if you could just get those parent volunteers some basic training, you would be able to provide those kids with such a better experience and you'd keep more kids playing basketball because they'd have a better experience with their coaches. And then it's kind of a trickle up effect that you get better coaches at the lower levels and then you're producing better players as you talked about. And hopefully we'd get eventually be able to get all kinds of coaches underneath that umbrella. But because everybody's in their own little silo and separated out and is trying to hold on to their business interests. I think it's really a challenge and USA basketball, I think is finding that out, but I think they're making some headway, but I just, I don't know if they're going to get there anytime soon, unless there would become a way to mandate it. And I just don't think here in our country that we're going to be able to pull that off anytime soon. But I do think it's a great idea if we could get more people to go through the USA basketball certification we'd be in a much better place with the game here in the U.S. Because as you said, the talent level in the United States is unbelievable. And we do have have lots and lots of great coaches, but we also, I think, are leaving so much on the table because we're not giving our coaches the training that they need in order to maximize what they could be. And all you have to do is show up at a, a youth league game or show up at an AAU game and you can see some you can see some what not to do as a coach. Let's put it that way. And there's also a lot of people out there doing a great job. All right, let's jump into the culture piece. Talk to me a little bit about, A, why culture is so important to you and why you think it has such a huge impact on winning and just providing a good experience for your players. And then we can dive into some of the things that you do to create the kind of culture that you want to work in with your team yeah i i want i want my teams to have i I want the players to feel like that they own the team they have ownership of the team it's not a dictated team by me um yeah i'm going to put some things in place like what we're going to run and you know offensively and defensively and um it's how I'd like us to play, and we would have numerous meetings as a as a team. And this the, the, this happens at all levels for the teams I've coached under eighteen, under nineteen, New Zealand national program, all the way up to the Cairns Taipans and men that are thirty two years old, all the way to twenty two years old. Um, <clears throat> And, that, and this is kind of what happens with Australian New Zealand sports, um, yeah, because that's obviously what I'm very familiar with. And um, at all different codes of the game, games in Australia, from Australian rules football to rugby union to cricket to rugby union to basketball, um, you know, you have obviously a, a figurehead, your coach, um, and then you develop your leadership group. Um, and, and I want the leadership group to monitor and enforce and discipline when things are not followed the way that we agree as a team. Not I've told them this is what we're doing. These are, it's all behavior based. It's like what acceptable behaviors do we have to live by to be a successful team and to be a great human being? And um, and represent our city, re- represent yourself, your family, your teammates at an extremely high level. What behaviors are acceptable for that to happen? And we meet, we talk, we whiteboard, we agree, we debate, and we come up with, you know, and I can get into it a little bit in a minute about exactly what we do, but um, those type of things uh get put on the table and agree to and then the team the team monitors that and meet on a regular basis to see how they're going and um how we can be better and how we can problem solve and and um you know build a culture that allows us to be successful 
So when you go through and you're working through that process with your team, obviously you have some things in mind that you feel are important to you. And maybe there are times where your team brings something to that table that maybe you weren't expecting. So just how do those, how do you steer those meetings, those sessions to make sure that the players get ownership of it, but you're also creating the kind of culture and the kinds of behaviors get up on that list that you want to make sure end up there? Yeah. So there's a process we go through. So, and I, and I talk when I do coaches stuff, uh, you know, Zoom, so on and so forth, I talk about this all the time. Like I feel coaches spend way too much time on offense and defense and not enough time on culture. And to me, it should be a third, a third and third. Um, Cause I think if your culture if your culture, if your if your offense, if your coach is poor, I mean, does it really matter what you run offense and defensively? Because you're just not going to be very good anyways. So, I think your culture's got to be on point. And successful teams that I've had have had phenomenal culture, and there's teams that have their cultures just not quite been right uh, for whatever reason, and you just stumble at the end, and uh, or you don't get there at all. So. Yeah, there's a process we go through. So we meet as a team, uh, and this is everybody, players, coaches, support staff, you know, that inner circle that's going to be with you on the journey. Um, you know, I guess the question that's put out there first is, well, how do we want to be seen? So how do we want our fans to see us? How do we want our family to see us? Um, sponsors see us? You know, how do we want the opposition to see us? And there'll be certain words that will come up like, and I'll just give you examples over the years, like what well, we want to be seen as being united. We want to be seen as being strong. Um, we want to be seen as being thankful, you know, just words like that. So they become our trademark words. <clears throat> I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, that's pretty, pretty simple, right? Well, how do we want to be seen as being strong? Okay, well, what are some behaviors that demonstrate that we are strong? And this is where they break up into groups and um, go away and talk about and, and brainstorm on some behaviors that will demonstrate that we are, you know, if we, how do we want to be seen? Is that we look strong, strong physically, strong mentally, here are some behaviors that um, represent that. So then the three groups, three or four groups will come back. Each group will go up onto the whiteboard and write up these behaviors. If there's double ups, they, you know, they just tick it off, so on and so forth. So then we sit there and then we debate. Well, no, we don't like this. We like this better, so on and so forth goes around the room. You know, this could go on for 15, 20 minutes, maybe even longer. And you cut that list of, 15, 10, 15 things, 10, 15 behaviors down to three. Well, these are the three behaviors that you can clearly demonstrate and see that show that we are strong. And you're gonna do that for three or four different words. Um, <clears throat> you know, we do that here in Charlotte. We have our trademark words and then we have behaviors that we hold each other accountable to demonstrate that we are thankful and you know, we want to, you know, we want to serve each other and we have great unity and passion and so on and so forth. So when that gets established, it is then it comes back to what I talked about earlier. Now the team has to monitor, police it um, and hold each other super accountable to it. And they'll debrief after practices, debrief after games and you know coaches are not really involved in these meetings because it's again like i said earlier it's player driven because i want you know especially with younger guys it it develops leaders it um teaches you to teaches you from within your peers to um be responsible for one another um as it would with a 32 year old man um 
and those guys monitor those different types of behaviors. So, you know, that's, that's one part of it. Um, <clears throat> an individual behavior thing that we do to build culture is something that we, that we call start, stop, keep. And those again are just behaviors. There are behaviors that we all do, and we can just obviously talk about basketball, but within the basketball world, there are behaviors that we need to start doing, we need to stop doing, and we need to keep doing to allow our teams to be successful. And this is, I've found this to be extremely confronting and very powerful. Um, you know, I've seen guys get really emotional about it. Um, and so how the process works is, again, the groups break up into three or four different groups. Um, I'll use myself as an example. Coach Fern will walk out of the room and he'll have a sheet of paper with behaviors on there that start, stop, keep. There are behaviors I need to start doing, stop doing, keep doing. While I'm doing that, the groups in the room are talking about me as well and the behaviors they want, they want me to start, stop, and keep doing. Come back into the room. They write their behaviors from the different groups up onto the whiteboard. Um, and then I go up and write down the behaviors that I need to start, stop, keep. A lot of them are very similar. Some guys are just so far off there. It's, you know, sometimes it's embarrassing. <laughs> and, it, and it becomes extremely confronting because it's... Um, it's about you. And if you don't change these behaviors, um, you know, some guys talk too much. Some guys don't talk at all. Well, it's a behavior. If you don't talk at all, well, it's pretty hard to play the game. If you don't talk at all, it's a behavior that you need to change. And that's just a simple one, but, um, you know, it gets confronting and then it just becomes an agreement and, um, and again, they monitor those things throughout the year. And, you know, the, the pro, team, pro teams I've coached back in Australia would debrief after every game on that stuff. How's our culture? How, how, do, we, how, do, you, how do we feel we were seen during that game? Are there things that we need to address, improve on, um, keep building on? And then, and then individually, you know, they go around the room and go, well, you know, I felt like I did a good job with this, you know, and I need to keep doing that. You know, I, you know, the stuff that we start, talked about that I needed to start doing, I'm not quite there with that. And guys would comment to that player about that. Here are some examples of where you did a good job. Um, you know, here's some behaviors that we talked about that you need to stop doing because it hurts our group, it hurts your performance. Um, it's just been really powerful stuff with the teams I've coached over the years. And, um, you know, we talk about that stuff here, um, because I think it builds your character and you're in a team sport. It's not about you. If you want to be an individual, go play tennis or golf or something like that. Um, you're playing a team game where all the pieces are hugely important. And yes, yeah, sometimes your, you know, your, your role's not quite what you want it to be, but at this certain point of the season or this season, that's what your role is going to be. So then that's another part of it. Well, what's your role? And I don't want to dictate the role to each player. So, you know, we talk about what the role should be from both my side as a coach and a coaching staff and a player. And then, you know, we meet, we meet in the middle. Um, I think some coaches put, huge expectations on some players that are just not capable of performing at that level at that point. Um, some guys want a huge role and shoot the ball every time. Well, no, that's not the role you're going to play. So you need to curve that down a little bit. So, you know, there are a lot of, there are a lot of layers to building culture in the programs that I've coached and it does take a lot of time, but it's like I said earlier, like you got to spend a third of your time, in my opinion, working on your culture that you reinforce every day at practice, in games, in video sessions. Um, and when those teams have been very good at that, it's a hugely enjoyable experience. You build relationships with players that I still have to this day that I keep in contact after years and years of years ago coaching different guys. Um, because you're just not dictating to them. You're treating them like a human, and and it's very respectful. And um, 
and been really, really, really successful. When you're doing that, and I'm picturing in my head and trying to figure out and work through that, spending a third of the time on culture, a third on offense, a third on your defense. As you're going through and you're planning your individual practices, so day to day, and you're building that culture piece of it into a daily practice, but you're also building it in across the scope of the entire season and kind of figuring out how we're going to get those things across to our players. And obviously you've already mentioned a couple with the start, stop, keep, and the other different activities that you've already talked about. But when you build that into the daily practice plan, how intentional do you have to be about making sure that you touch on those key cultural pieces, those key things that you want to make sure that you get done on a daily basis. Because I know that as you get into a season that it becomes very easy for coaches to – the first thing that gets pushed to shot, uh, pushed aside, right, usually, Aaron, is those culture, those extra things that coaches consider to be extra things. Whereas what you're saying, and I think what most successful coaches realize is that that culture piece is central to your success. But yet we know that sometimes coaches get caught up and that gets pushed aside. So how do you go about making sure that you build that into your daily practice planning? And what does that process look like as you're sitting down to write a practice plan or contribute to a practice plan as an assistant coach like you are at UNC Charlotte? Oh, yeah. Well, if I took some words like, you know, disciplined, tough, united, you know, those three words, for example, well, you know, we would have talked about some behaviors that demonstrate being disciplined, be on time, hustle to drills, um, don't shortcut cuts you need to make, you know, correct pivoting, just all those little things that require unbelievable discipline and just coaching that stuff on the run at a really high level but it's just not me and that's what I'm trying to say it's just not me coaching that it's the players coaching each other on that stuff um, so that just becomes kind of like a norm behavior um, you know building a practice plan well if we will, we want to be seen as being tough well, we better do some drills to build toughness um, to be able to demonstrate that behavior. So there'll be, have to be certain drills. Um, and and when, I, when I talk about toughness, it's just not physical toughness, it's mental toughness, body language, uh, when you're fatigued, when you're dealing with adverse situations, bad refereeing, you're on the road, crowd's getting after you, you're down 20, you know, you're, your body language still stays positive because things can turn um, like recognizing and holding each other accountable to those different types of things. So building that into practice and coaching that stuff again on the run, both myself, my staff, the players towards each other. Um, I guess that's how, that's how I would on a day to day incorporate those behaviors that we want to be seen by and incorporate them into developing game plans, practice plans, um, day after day, um, you know, to be successful on where you want to try and end up. And it takes a lot of work, you know, like you talked about it, like that stuff just gets pushed to, pushed to the side sometimes. Um, most coaches, you know, a lot of coaches just, just get really hard, play harder. Okay, well, what does that mean? Um, right. You know, what does that mean? You know, what behaviors do you have to demonstrate to do that? Um, so, um, yeah, you've got to incorporate certain drills, but I just think it's a lot of recognizing that stuff on the run and holding guys accountable to the stuff that we've agreed to kind of in the early part of the preseason leading into the real official game one, those things get put in place. And um, it's just a real monitoring thing day after day. I know the answer to this question is going to vary depending upon the individual, but I think it leads to an interesting discussion. 
when you bring players into your program at UNC Charlotte or when you brought players into your team with the Taipans and they're new to this confrontation, this having these difficult conversations, this holding other players accountable, how long does it take for a player? And again, I understand it varies, but when you think about having someone get comfortable with the idea that they're going to have to confront a teammate and that they're going to be confronted and they're going to have to hold someone accountable and they're going to be held accountable. Not everybody comes from that type of program that has that same expectation. So when you bring a player in, how long does that process take for them to understand it? And is there anything that you do to kind of help them along the way to make sure that they understand the value? Are there side conversations, let's say with freshmen who you bring in and say, look, this is what we're going to expect. Maybe you've already had that conversation on the recruiting trail. Just talk a little bit about how you bring players into that cultural system that you've set up. Yeah, I guess there'd be two levels for me, like in Australia with the with the Taipans, you know, coach guys like Travis Trice come from Michigan State, Scotty Wilberkin come from Florida. Um, that same year, Scotty Wilberkin played, who came from Florida. I had Tory Craig, who came from USC Upstate. You're talking about two opposite ends of the spectrum when it comes to high major Final Four type teams that Scotty Wilberkin played for, where Tory played for a low-level Division One program at the time. And those two both came to our program as rookies. Um, coming onto a team that had some older, experienced guys that were fantastic people but have been part of our culture for, you know, three or four years uh, with younger guys. And when your culture is that strong with a core group of players and you add, you know, pieces to it, those guys can form pretty quickly um, because they know you've been successful and they are good people and they're not disrespecting you. They're not, they're definitely not doing that to you when it comes to understanding the acceptable behavior norms of our program. Um, you know, and Scotty come from Florida. I mean, he, you know, was a bubble NBA guy. Um, Tory was, you know, a, a rookie coming from upstate where he did everything for that program and he came into a program where, well, that wasn't required and his role had to change drastically and he came off the bench and um, you know that season we went 21 and 7 and went to the NBL finals and and got you know unfortunately got beat by the New Zealand Breakers um, but to answer your question like they they conformed you know with there some little bumpy with there some bumps on the road early on you know you know because we do some things differently when it, you know, ice bath recovery and pool recoveries and we're going to meet at this time and you can do this and you can't do that. And, um, but I always just felt if you explain to them the why, which we did, and they understood why we do this, um, there was a clear understanding and just being really truthful with them. Um, and when, we, when they get into those meetings, and I found this here at Charlotte, is I actually find the players find it very um, refreshing. Uh, you know, here you, you get a bit of a sense. It's like, I want you to do this and do this, do this hard. Um, you know, kind of been dictated to in a sense where they – they come into these meetings that we do and some of the new faces are like, oh, this is pretty cool. You know, like, you know, we're, we're actually getting a say on what we want and how we want to, how we want to be seen. Um, and they get into it and the debate, the, the debates that go on are, are really interesting. 
and you get great dialogue and you do get some stuff that you haven't even thought of because, you know, with the transfer portal these days, you're getting guys from all different programs around the country and they bring a lot of those experiences to your program, the stuff that they have liked, they haven't liked, um, and you meet you meet on common ground after you do these meetings. And um, and look, you get some guys that just never figure it out. Yeah, you do. Well, they just don't last very long within your program. That happens both professionally and at the college level um, because there's a level of behavior that the core group has established that knows right and those that don't conform to that, well, they don't, they don't hang on, and um, they feel left out, and they actually move themselves on. So, um, and that's happened at the professional level with the teams I've had as well. So, um, yeah, I, I hope that that kind of answers the question that way. It absolutely does. I think that you make a great point that getting it established is the key and that's something that doesn't happen overnight and as you've said numerous times it takes a lot of investment it takes a lot of time it takes a lot of buy-in but once you have that established then as you said once you bring players into that program and they know that it's been successful then they're much more likely to conform see the value in it and as you also said sharing the why with players I think is something that if you go back to probably the early days of your playing career, there weren't a whole lot of coaches that were sharing that why. It was much more of the, you're going to do it because we're doing it, not because you're going to ask me questions about the why. And it was really something that I think about my own playing career, and I'm 51 years old, and I don't think a coach at any level ever said to me, this is why we're doing this. It was just presented to me. This is what we're doing. And you really didn't have much of a choice or a say or, or anything in that along those lines. And obviously coaching has changed now, but by establishing a good culture, you make it much easier to bring those new players into the fold and get them to buy into the program and what it is that you're doing. I mean, you, you, I mean, I mean, let's take the Spurs back in the, you know, the Tony Parker, Tim Duncan, that, that type of era, David Robinson, that, that era. Like, <clears throat> we know in the basketball world that the Spurs have an unbelievable sp- culture, right? Certain, they recruit certain players, they draft certain players, they bring, you know, when they draft, when they trade, they're bringing in certain people that they feel will fit their culture. Now, <clears throat> those players, when they get there, think they know what the culture is, but they don't until they really get there. Well, that's no different than, than you know, some of the programs that I've had as well. But And there are a number of phenomenal programs in this country at all levels that have amazing cultures and it's talked about and it's established um, and players come into those programs both professionally and at the college level. Uh, there are phenomenal high school programs, AU programs in this country that have that stuff. You know, you know when you've been part of a great team. You know. I mean, I know when I've played on great teams. I know when I've played on poor teams. And a lot of it's just been a culture. It's that. <clears throat> and this is what I find the beauty of coaching is that the mission for me is to get that cohesion and connection between every member of the team for a common goal and it's so difficult to achieve i mean so difficult to achieve takes so much work um because it's just not about what man-to-man defense we're doing and what on-ball coverage we're doing or what we're running the flex offense and this is going to win us a championship it's not about that like, Michael Jordan could have gone and played the triangle, the flex, the flow, whatever. It wouldn't have mattered. Um, but again, those teams too had just a, a connection with each other and 
and a culture that and a behavior that was required if they wanted to be successful. And I think that's the same with any team. How did the opportunity for you to come to UNC Charlotte, how did that opportunity get to you? So um, I coached Aaron Baines in high school in Australia. Um, and at the time, Coach Sanchez was an assistant coach at Washington State. And I got a, a very close relationship with Ben Johnson, um, who was at Washington State at the time with Tony Bennett and Dick Bennett. And uh, Ben was recruiting Aaron Baines. And, you know, I had a good, uh, an outstanding relationship with Ben. And, you know, just through the process, I felt like that that was going to be a good situation for Aaron to develop and be coached really, really hard by by Dick Bennett at the time, and then Tony. Um, and just over those years, you know, you just develop that relationship with the coaching staff, and, and Ron was on that staff at the time. And, you know, we'd kept in contact over the years when he'd gone with Tony to Virginia, and, you know, he was recruiting players in Australia, and... Um, he just happened to be recruiting Cody Statman, who's now at Virginia. Um, and um, you know, a couple of months after Cody had committed to Virginia, he ended up getting this, this Charlotte uh, opportunity and asked me if I'd be interested in coming to the U.S. and being part of his staff. Um, you know, obviously a pretty big decision. Um, you know, I've got two kids, you know, at the time, I had two kids in high school in Australia. You know, I'd have to move high schools, move to the other side of the world. My wife's American, so it was an opportunity for her to come back to the U.S. Um, and so we made that made that call, and um, here we are. So um, <laughs> it's been very different, you know, coaching professional basketball in Australia. Uh, for a club that was, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, not not uh, batting at the at the same level as some of the bigger clubs in Australia, but definitely punching above our weight when it came to playing and competing, um, and just coaching pros is just totally different. Um, you know, you're getting the cream of the crop per se because they're pros, and um, you know. Co- just college basketball, just coaching younger athletes. Come, some of these guys are, you know, seventeen years old, coming out of high school. Um, their basketball journey hasn't even started. I mean, they're going to improve so much more after they leave college. It's just us trying to help them set themselves up for that next part of their life. And um, so that's been very different for me, but. As we mentioned earlier, going back to coaching under 18s, coaching under 23s, semi-professional, like I've, I've, I'd had many years of coaching those type of players and many of them that have gone on to college in the US and, and moved on to play professionally in, in the Australian NBL. So that helped me transition into this and I've been a head coach and I've been an assistant coach. I've been a second assistant coach. You know, just all those experiences help you transition around the world at different levels and um, and uh, really, really enjoying this opportunity, which, you know, when we in- inherited this program, it was in a tough position and, you know, we've had to <clears throat> work very hard to improve it and it still needs a lot of work to keep improving it. Um but it's definitely heading in the right direction. And um, a lot of these things that we're talking about, we're putting in place here. And, and uh, yeah, it's been a, been a really fun experience. Definitely very valuable. And, you know, you're always learning the game. From a recruiting standpoint, when you guys are out on the road and you're looking for players that are going to fit into what you're trying to do, obviously there's a certain level of talent that's required to be able to play college basketball at the division one level. But what are some things that you're looking at maybe from an intangible standpoint that you guys really zero in on 
that make you feel like a player is going to be a good fit for your program. And you and I talked in our pre-podcast call about the fact that recruiting high school players may not become the norm anymore just because of the way the transfer portal is and the way the rules are set up at this point. But just thinking about recruiting, and I'm I guess mostly focused on high school players, but just thinking about even guys that are in the transfer portal, what are you looking for from an intangible standpoint for, from guys that you want to bring into your program? Yeah, priority number one is just character. Um, that's the first thing we're talking to coaches, AU high school coaches, coaches that coach against these guys. Um, <clears throat> just how do they carry themselves? How do they behave? It's all about behavior for us. So it just comes back to your character. Um, priority number one. Number two is just your competitive spirit. You know, your toughness, you, you know, just your will to compete. Because um, if you're a great person and you're willing to compete and really work because um, you want to get better, you know, we'll, we'll help coach you up and, and grow your skill level and grow your understanding of the game. Um, you know, your willingness to share, you know, a big, big trademark word for us in our program is servanthood. You know, like, are you prepared to serve? Are you prepared to help help people, help teammates? Um, you know, another one has been really thankful for <clears throat> thankful for all opportunities. You know, both positive and and challenging ones. Um, those are the types of traits and behaviors that we're really looking for. Now, there are certain skill level things that you you need and you talked about that you got to have a certain level of skill to play it you know the high major the mid major the low major you you just have certain skills for those types of levels and you know, obviously they're very important for our program too but <clears throat> and probably the last one is just really understanding how to play like play the game in the way that we want it played now, obviously, other coaches have different ways of wanting to play, but within our program, you know, we're a ball movement, player movement, cutting, sharing program. Um, and do you have the understanding of that, of dribble penetration in the half court, transition push, working off on ball screens, ball comes into the post, do you have an understanding of the game? the spacing where your teammates are, so on and so forth. So <clears throat> those are type of, those are the types of things that we really value. You know, everyone loves shooting and athleticism and length and, you know, you, you definitely shooting is very important for sure and, and something that we really value too. So, but it's hard to tick all those boxes. But I've coached some guys over my time that have been extremely talented players but haven't been great teammates. And you just don't have success with that. Um, I've coached teams that lack talent and definitely not as talented as some other teams. But their culture and their, their connectiveness is just first class and has enabled us to be really successful. And I think you see that, for example, in the NCAA tournament when you get some of these low major or mid major programs go out there and outplay some really high-level, well-resourced, super-talented, high-major programs. Well, to me, it just comes back to teamwork and culture. And that's the stuff that's really important. And I think you can be – well, you can. You, you can be – you can reach the top of the mountain with that, with that type of – with that type of mindset and build of what you want to get there and but you gotta work as we've talked about multiple times on this show, you just you gotta work really hard at it every day. I think that you said it earlier that you know when you play on a good team, a team that's together, a team where everybody's working hard to be a great teammate and you have a good culture and conversely, if you've ever played or coached a team that doesn't have that, just the experience of going to practice day in and day out with a team that isn't together, that doesn't have the right culture, 
that can be draining, that can be exhausting. And I think, as we've said multiple times, by putting in that time to build the right culture in the long run, you're going to end up creating an environment that's going to allow you to be successful. And as we said, you have to have a certain amount of talent. You can you can have the greatest culture in the world if you have players who should be playing Division Three basketball and they're trying to play Division One basketball. But but I think you gave a great example when you talk NCAA tournament. You say these lower major programs that pull upsets with players who on paper aren't as talented, but yet because they play together, because they're great teammates, because they have culture, they can sometimes upset those teams that maybe have more raw talent on paper, but don't have the same type of culture that another team does. And I think that's a great lesson to be learned out there for coaches at any level that, look, what you want to do, and I think all coaches would agree with this, is that whatever 10 players you have on your team or 15 players you have on your team or however big your, big your roster is, your goal as a coach every year should be able to get the ma- to be able to try to get the maximum out of that roster. And it doesn't matter if that roster is the most talented roster in the country or it's the least talented roster in the country. Your job should be to try to get the most out of that roster to maximize what each individual player can be and maximize what your team can be. And I think by building the right culture, that's really what we're talking about here is maximizing what you have. And obviously there's recruiting and there's all different kinds of things that go into who you have on your roster. But ultimately, when day one of practice opens up, if you can build the right culture and you can maximize the team that you have, as a coach, you're going to have a lot of fun. Your players are going to have a lot of fun if that's the kind of situation that you're building. And I think that's the that's the type of environment that all of us, whether we're coaches, whether we're players, that's what we want to be in is a culture that we enjoy being a part of. And when you enjoy being a part of it, it's going to ultimately lead to success and more wins on the scoreboard. I think that's something that, as we've said a bunch of times, coaches sometimes can push that aside because they got to get in that one extra out of bounds player. They got to do 10 more minutes of scouting. And so they tend to push off that culture stuff. So we're, we're here to advocate for coaches out there and get, get your culture stuff right. And you're going to end up a lot more successful in the long run. I mean, I've, I've coached games and I've coached teams where I walk away as a coach losing a game and not making the playoffs or whatever over the course of a season. And I've walked out of there and gone, you know, for a game and I've walked out of there and go, man, we played hard. And while we played well together, we just on the night just weren't good enough to beat that team. They just had more talent or they just did that better than us with better talent. Like, and you've got to be so satisfied with that and not get caught up with the W and the L. It's maximizing the effort of the collective group um, and working on the things that you're working on every day. And, I, and I've walked away at the end of a season and gone, I mean, the last year I coached with the Taipans, like we were – we didn't make the playoffs and I walked out of there and the effort that those guys gave and the, con- and the, and the, just the connectiveness that they had, I couldn't have asked for anything more. Like it was phenomenal and it's enjoyable. It's satisfying. It's satisfying. Um, the players know, cause you, like I said, you know, when you play on a great with great teammates, cause you have a great relationship you know, relationships with your teammates and with your coaches. And, you know, you got to have a great culture with your coaching staff too. And it's really challenging and it's, it should be, that's what we're in. That's what we're in this for. Um, You got to embrace that. You got to enjoy the, the competitive side of it. Um, And if you can accomplish that as a coach out there with your team and with your staff, and you get to the end of the year and you you know it and you feel it, well, you know you're heading in the right direction. Likewise, if it's the other way, then you know it's not right and it's and you've got to make some changes 
and some improvement. And if you do that, then the game's really enjoyable and it, it builds great character. And I've had numerous younger guys back in Australia come up to me on the street or when I'm out at a restaurant or whatever and come up and thank me for those years of coaching them as juniors and the behaviors and the discipline that we had within our program has helped them in their life with their work situation with their just with their home life i mean that's just so rewarding to hear that stuff um that you can make an impact on people's lives like that and um through coaching a game but that's the power of sport it absolutely is i think that that's really something when i think about what coaching is all about that impact that goes beyond just the basketball court and it extends into players lives that's really what we're talking about here when we're talking about coaching and the ability to use a game that we all love to be able to impact the people that we come in contact with through the game as coaches is really I think the most powerful thing that we have as coaches this has been a great conversation, Aaron. Before we wrap it up, I want to ask you one more question. It's a two-parter. First part is, when you look ahead over the next year or two, what's the biggest challenge that you see on the horizon for yourself and for your program? And then number two, when you wake up in the morning and you think about what you do on a daily basis, what brings you the most joy about being a basketball coach? So your biggest challenge and your biggest joy moving forward. Uh, my biggest challenge, I think being a being an international coach in this country um, and trying to break into an opportunity to be a head coach. Um, I mean I feel like I feel like I have the experience, um, the knowledge um, <clears throat> You know, I come from a, obviously a different part of the world uh, into this country um, and getting an opportunity to coach at, you know, a, a good level. Um, I think that's a big challenge, um, but definitely something that, you know, you aspire to achieve that. That's, that's, what, I, that's what I'm hopeful for. Um, could I could I potentially end end up overseas somewhere back in Australia, New Zealand, uh, anywhere around the world? Yeah, I'm open to that too. Um, but um, so I think that's definitely a big challenge, and just breaking some of those barriers down here a little bit. And obviously, the NBA's tried to do that with some international coaches as well, but that's been very challenging too. I, I feel that's a bit the same on in the college in the college world. Um, but hey, you got to aspire to achieve that, and so yeah, that that's definitely uh, something that I, well, I'm looking forward to. Um, the second part of the question, um, you know, when I wake up in the morning, you know, it, to me, it's about well, we, you know, we've got a game on Friday, and it's about preparing for that and preparing myself as a staff, preparing. Um, preparing our players um, that's priority number one because um, we we as uh, we as coaches have got to put them in positions to be successful and we've got to educate them on what that takes to be successful when it comes to preparation um, the scout, the video scout, the paper scout, the skill development, the stuff um, that they need to do to keep building on day after day. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, just pre just preparing them and making sure that they're not surprised by anything um, because there are a lot of different things that can come at you real quick and you want to be prepared for that stuff. Um, there's no greater satisfaction for me than having guys put in the work. And it may not happen for you Friday night when we play. It may not happen for another month, but you just got to keep putting in that work. 
every day. You know, a lot of levels of preparing, um, diet, hydration, everything, um, to be the, you know, to be an ultimate athlete. Um, but then when that moment comes and you, and they have that success, man, that's rewarding. Like that gets me so excited when I, when I see that stuff. Um, and it actually disappoints me the other way when I see players that don't do that and think it's just going to happen. Cause you can't cheat. You just, you just can't cheat the game. Like the Jordans, the Kobe Bryant's, so on and so forth, the world, they just didn't show up and be like they are like, <laughs> like uh, so they, true. they put in amazing work. And we hear all the stories about Kobe and Jordan, you know, how demanding they were, but, on their teammates, but also just on themselves. Well, that's why they, you know, LeBron James, like the work that they put in, the investment they put into their bodies and and understanding the game, that's why they're the, they're the greatest ever, because they put in the work. They just didn't show up, and that's what a lot of these guys don't understand. You know, like you've got to put in a lot of work and you can't cheat the game because it will get you, um, and you won't realize your potential, and I think it's, as coaches, it's our responsibility to try and educate them as best we can. Some of them really grab it with two hands and run with it. Some of them don't. Um, but when 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 those guys do grab it and work and have succeed, yeah. To me personally, man, that's that's so enjoyable and so rewarding, and that's what you wake up each day trying to achieve that that's a terrific answer and it's so true i think as we've said the ability to have that kind of impact and to get players to see who they are and what they can become and maybe push them beyond where they could get on their own is really what coaching is all about aaron before we get out i want to give you a chance to share how people can reach out to you if, whether you want to share social media email, website, just how they can follow you, how they can follow Charlotte men's basketball. And then I'll jump back in and wrap things up. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can, uh, you can follow me on Twitter, just Aaron Fern 14. Um, you know, just find the Charlotte men's basketball, um, on Twitter, on the internet. Um, you know, there's a number of different things out there on YouTube that I've, you know, talk the game and I definitely like to share the game. I'm not one of those coaches that try and keep all the secrets to myself. Um, you know, I think it's important to share the game and, and uh, help people grow and help them develop. Um, I have coaches, you know, contact me all the time about different things that I talk about in the coaching world and, and, have said you know have have questions for me and I'll, I'll get back to you the best i can and and um and uh and look and looking forward to hearing from people and um i really appreciate all the coaches out there that put in the long hours to coach it's really difficult and whew, it's really challenging in this country there's definitely lots of different angles that you have to deal with um coaching these players and um but put the work in, believe in what you do, um, you know, be confident with what you do, but don't be arrogant about it. And um, if you do that at a really high level and be consistent with it, then you're going to have success. Your teams are, and those players ultimately will too. So, um, yeah, wish nothing but the best for everybody out there. That's well said, Aaron. We cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule to jump on with us. Really appreciate it. And to everyone out there, Thanks for listening, and we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoopheads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.